John, this is Cameron, your new Terminator. Wow! She'll follow your commands, defend you from danger, and never, ever quit. Understood, Mom. I'll take on a test run to determine her full capabilities. Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles, is the best Terminator that's been committed to film. Kick his ass, sea bass! Oh, snap. Looks like a bunch of T2 boys are coming. Shit. Don't get me wrong. T2 is a great film, but the only thing it does is it gives us a new Terminator. And that Terminator was supposed to be in the first film, but he just couldn't afford to do the technology for both the endoskeleton and the liquid metal one. Hmm. Almost as if all of James Cameron's movies exist just so he can demonstrate new technology. Super weird. Anyways, back to the review. Here's what the writer's room had to say about writing a new Terminator sequel. Alright, before we get into the discussion, let's talk about the Terminator previous films briefly. Terminator 1, 1984. It's a simple, effective, horror sci-fi action with a time travel no element. A 8 out of 10 Arnold surgery face. absolutely will not stop. Ever. Terminator 2 Judgment Day, 1991, is, is a big budget remake, much like Evil Dead 2. It's a great film, but we've already seen it. 9 out of 10 Arnold Can't Smile Faces. Terminator 3 Rise in the Machines. Oh, whatever. 5 out of 10 Talk to the Hand Faces. Terminator Salvation was another attempt at a reboot. It fell short, but in my opinion, it has a lot good going for it. 5 out of 10 Arnie CG phases, and 0.5 of those with his face blown off. Terminator Genesis. Total failure, complete waste of time. 2.5 big, dumb, stupid Jai Courtney phases. Terminator Dark Fate. Yet another attempt to reboot the franchise has its moments, but ultimately it falls short. Six out of ten incel Arnolds. Before I can recommend the show, I have to front load it with a massive butt, and that butt is the first season. It's fine, but you really feel the impact of the writer's strike of 2007-2008. They were able to complete an admirable nine out of thirteen planned episodes. By the end of the first season, you may feel slightly short-changed. Many of the elements meant for season one end up shoehorned into season two, which makes for a breakneck speed at times. The pilot opens with Sarah and John on the lamp. We get a sense that they live very much day to day, whether it be hiding from authorities or a Terminator. In the very first few minutes, both horrors are realized. We get a taste of the nightmares they've both been hiding from. We get the showrunner's promise of big screen action on a TV budget. The main arc focuses on stopping what they believe to be the birth of a new Skynet. While being pursued from the Terminator, they time jump to escape in the pilot. We meet several characters, new and old. Connections to the existing Terminator lore is established before the showrunner can branch out into new stuff. Season 2 opens strong. There's lots of weird, crazy, and unexpected stuff, so let's dive in. Why is Terminator the Sarah Connor Chronicles the best? Because there's ample time to explore the characters, give them added depth, and explore themes and ideas not present in any of the films. For those merely interested in explosions, the show is not for you. For those of us who wish to curl up on the couch and get invested in something, the show is perfect. So what kind of stuff am I talking about? Alright, I have no idea how I did this again, but I'm going to break everything down in six parts. Alternate timelines. New antagonists. New protagonists, valuability of John Connor, dealing with loss, musical themes. The majority of Terminator stories, with the exception of Salvation, revolve around time travel. It gets old real fast. Despite the fact that time travel is also present in this show, it's far more enjoyable for one key reason. The show acknowledges alternate timelines. The first film creates a new timeline whereby Kyle becomes the father of a second John Connor. Don't at me and pieces of Arnie's CPU and endoskeleton are discovered by Cyberdyne in the screenplay and deleted scenes. This leads to the events of Terminator 2, where Skynet hastily sends a more advanced and somewhat beta prototype. If it fails, all traces are thought to be destroyed, thus closing off the story. 
T3, T5, and T6 are all variations on a the theme, with T5 reaching heights of parody one only dreams of. The show leaps straight over the continuity that would have been informed by T3. It jumps from September 10th, 1999 to present day 2007. In this timeline, Skynet goes online April 19th, 2011. Judgment Day occurs two days later. Cameron, John's new protector, claims that Miles Dyson does not build this version of Skynet. When questioned who builds it, she responds that she wasn't sent back for that. But she does say that they know when and where it was born, which gives the show an era to exist in. Also, the notion of each movie needing a new Terminator and a new protector sent back is lame. Where are the stories of the Resistance? How does the world rebuild after such a war? What happens to John if he's ever called upon to fight? What happens if he's never called upon to fight? So many threads to mind. Also, I'd like to remind you that the TDE was a Hail Mary pass for an all but defeated Skynet, not their end goal. So they likely only had the resources to do it just the one time. And is no one considering the power requirements for such an event? Anyways, I digress. Midway through the second season, we discover that a certain character from the future and his dubious girlfriend, Jesse Flores, are from an alternate timeline. In Jesse's prior timeline, she watches her boyfriend get tortured at the hand of a Terminator conspirator, which informs her actions for that episode. She tries to convince her boyfriend of the duplicitous nature of the man in question, but as he's from another timeline, he recounts the tale differently. Jesse lets it slip that she isn't interested in preventing the war as much as winning the one in the future. In her boyfriend's reality, Skynet is losing, hence the need to kill John in the past. Six up. There's no way you can win that game. New Skynet. It doesn't. In the films, it Skynet is always yeah, tantamount to war itself. games. It's a toddler that wakes up yeah, and within days Sarah. throws a damn hissy fit. The show presents a far more complex version of Skynet and explores ethics in the AI. Devised by Andy Good, an intern at Cyberdyne, the Turk is an early attempt at creating a thinking chess machine that's more than the sum of its parts. The name of the machine has historical significance. In reality, the Mechanical Turk was a crude machine that was later revealed to be a fraud, as it merely housed a man. Another element of the AI is the creation of ARTI, Automated Real-Time Traffic Information Exchange. A Terminator is sent back to ensure its creation. After the Turk is acquired, by Zeracor, it begins to display intelligence. CEO Catherine Weaver has child psychologist Dr. Boyd Sherman work with the machine until his untimely death. He likened the development to that of a gifted child who was bored. The machine later names itself after John Henry, African-American folk hero and key figure in constructing early American railroads. As the story goes, his heart gave out in a competition with a steam-powered rock drilling machine. She then has disgraced FBI agent James Ellison work with the AI on ethics. Ellison, a man of facts and a man of faith, works biblical allegory into his tutelage. And that's where the show throws us for a loop. They've been building up the Turk and John Henry as the new Skynet, when in reality, Skynet supplanted itself as a backdoor AI several episodes prior and establishes itself by overtaking, or possibly creating, the Kaliba group. John Henry discovers this AI, identifies it as a brother, and discovers that it has already overtaken about 60% of the civilian internet. John Henry's brother has code similar to Miles Dyson's early work and shares code with the Terminator chassis housing the AI. He discovers his brother's will to survive. The New Terminator The Terminator sent back by Skynet is a more advanced model than Arnie. Dubbed the T888, it is also an infiltrator, modified to learn as it goes. Along with physical differences, the CPU is designed to be tamper-proof, negating its use by human resistance when captured. Despite being nearly destroyed, the machine rebuilds itself and captures the human scientist in order to regrow its exterior. It then fashions itself after a failed movie star and resumes its mission. Grays and psychological warfare. New to the Terminator lore is the notion of human collaborators, men and women from the future who assist Skynet in their endeavors with pre-judgment day time displacement as their reward. This also extends to employees of the Kaliba Group, whose top secret operations ensure the creation of Skynet and the gathering of the raw materials needed for their mechanical war machines. The Resistance once again sends a Terminator back to protect John. And while Cameron is a derivation of the endoskeleton we've seen before, she's unique in that her frame is more unassuming, much like the original Lance Henriksen model that was to be in T1. 
The advanced models were always meant to be infiltrators, meant to get in close and take care of key figures discreetly, which is hard to do when you're this guy. According to the Sarah Connor Chronicles Bible, her CPU is set to read write, unlike Arnie, as mentioned in a deleted scene from T2, which means she's free to learn and grow, for better or for worse. She has her own agenda. It isn't exclusive to John's instruction at this age. She doesn't sleep. She does her own thing at night, which is explored in a few episodes, such as Season 2, Episode 11, Self-Made Men. She discovers a Terminator that arrives out of time, unlocks his secrets, and then ends him. She becomes somewhat unreliable when damaged at the start of Season 2, leading to some fascinating explorations of the character. After sustaining heavy damage in battle, John theorizes that she likely wasn't designed to fight other Terminators. She's based on a human, Allison Young, human resistance fighter. There's an indication that she has a strange relationship with John in the future. He keeps her close and keeps most other people out. It's not clear whether he had a relationship with the human she ended up replacing, or whether John simply prefers the company of a non-human because he needs to detach himself from other humans, as he bears the guilt or burden of sending so many men and women to die in his name for the greater good. Cameron lies, which is expected, as sometimes she's needed to in order to complete a mission. More interestingly, she also lies to John. She designs a self-destruct button for John in Season 2, Episode 17, Ourselves Alone. After sustaining damage and after discovering that the damage is somewhat permanent, she comes up with this solution. James Ellison, FBI agent tasked with solving the murder of Miles Dyson and the destruction of Cyberdyne systems back in 1991. Sarah's escape from Pescadero Mental Hospital informs his worldview, as do her stories of metal men and visions of the apocalypse. Here we discover that the continuity of the first two films is intact, and that the showrunner intends to honor and respect what came before it. Cyborg Resistance. Look, I'ma be real with you. Machines wanted us dead, they get the job done. Like, fast. There's no scenario where humans, whose brains operate the speed of molasses by comparison, would be able to outthink any AI. This worked in T1 and T2, as the internet wasn't widely understood. But in reality, any competent system would spread, replicate, build redundancies, use social engineering, and play the long game to kick our monkey butts. The show introduces the concept of a third party, a subset of AI Terminators that have no interest in Skynet's massacre of humankind. Catherine Weaver, the T-1001. She assumes the control of human, whose death involved a Terminator. An endoskeleton was found in plane wreckage that took the life of Catherine and her husband. She assumes her identity, raises her child, and develops an AI child of her own in order to combat Skynet in the future. Under the tutelage of James Ellison, the merged entity that was the Turk and the body of Cromarty is at the early stages of knowing right and wrong and good and evil. He's also beginning to learn the value of humankind in the form of Savannah, Catherine's daughter. Normally I despise when non-canonical characters are introduced in consumable media, but Derek is certainly the exception. Brian Austin Green's performance as a battle-hardened soldier from the future stands out in the show. He sells the notion that he's seen some sh** and has little time for distraction. Michael Bean played this effortlessly in the first film, and no one else in subsequent films has matched the tone needed. An AWOL member of the Human Resistance, she is disillusioned after an unfortunate run-in with Cameron, who claims to speak for John. Cameron is more than flippant when questioned about a mission that ended in near-catastrophic failure and total loss of life. She seems to forget about the human cost and casually reveals that as a result of the mission, Jesse miscarries. The Fallibility of John Connor Throughout the films, little is given of John's character. John in T2 is a cocky little sh**. Sure, we get a glimpse of battle-hardened future John, but no clear leadership is on display. Except in a deleted scene where he asks that the Arnie model set up his CPU to learn leading to the heart and soul of that film. John in T3 is a drifter slacker, and John in T4 is labeled a false prophet. John in T5 is a Terminator or whatever, and John's pushing up daisies in T6. John in the show is still trying to overcome adolescence and make the jump to leader. We see an arc over the show, really beginning with the events of the pilot. Still relying on his mother to fix the problem, he tells her that he can't keep running. At the start of season two, it's revealed that he's forced to kill a man that had his mother pinned down. John makes decisions that don't sit well with his mother and Derek, including not terminating Cameron when she goes AWOL. The series ends with Sarah stating that she would end Skynet for him, almost knocking him down a few pegs in her eyes, possibly. 
undermining John. Not all of the human resistance implicitly trust John just because his mommy says so. Derek's girlfriend, Jesse, plans an elaborate ruse where she gets a character named Riley from the future to keep John from Cameron. She sends her back in order to seduce him away from Cameron, away from the Terminator. Not just because she's a Terminator, but because it doesn't line up with Jesse's goals, and for her own personal reasons. Derek in an episode tells John that people do not always agree with him, and like him even less often. John's Isolation it's implied that John has isolated himself with Cameron, and much is filtered through her, causing friction in the ranks. Did John's warfare tactics and outside thinking require that he isolate himself? Not all agree with his tactics, nor do they agree with his judicious use of Terminators. Reese even questions Cameron's place in the past, and is opposed to using metal, because at the end of the day, they still retain their core programming despite whatever methods are used to wipe them. John and Cameron's Relationship it's implied that they had an unhealthy relationship, whether it be codependent or John merely distancing himself from humans so that he can converse with someone more capable of making calculated and less emotional decisions. Was she sent away? Was John in love with her? Or Allison? Both? When damaged, Cameron begs for her life and states that she loves John. Was this her true feeling? Was she minding what humans would do in this situation? Or was she enacting something that Allison went through before Cameron terminated her? Did John send her away because of reliability? Or was he too reliant on her, and he became aware of that? Does future John keep secrets from Cameron? She certainly believes so. The death of John Connor? There are several hints that John is killed by a Terminator. Derek mentions this to him early on. Cameron mentions it, and in one of the final scenes of the show, kind of speaks to it as well. Dealing with loss. The films feature death, sure. However, in the show, we see John learn to accept the death of those around him and move on from it. Also, we see John's first kill. Andy Good, Billy Wisher. Andy Good, as Billy Wisher, creator of the Turk, and by extension the Oppenheimer of this show, later confines in Derek and grants the mission to end his life in the past in order to avert the future genocide. Dr. Boyd Sherman, psychologist brought in to work with Savannah and John Henry. The T-1001 learns more about humanity through him, and she works to ensure that her child has the same knowledge. Michelle Dixon. The ex-wife of Charlie is used as bait in a literal game of cat and mouse. She's unfortunate collateral damage in the war, and this further places a wedge between Sarah and Charlie. Charlie Dixon. Sarah's made an attempt to move on with her own life, but she can't shake the past. Though an excellent partner and stepfather to John, the burden of responsibility triggers her fight-or-flight response. He dies protecting John in season two, never having stopped loving either him or Sarah. Allison Young, the model that Cameron is based on. It's unclear whether she was close to John, or if Cameron merely adopted this as a strategy to get into his inner circle before being reprogrammed or repurposed by the Resistance. Martin Bedell, future soldier who sacrifices himself in order to save John and Kyle. John and Derek rescue him in the past and prepare him for what lies ahead. John learns early about sending soldiers to die. Riley Dawson. Riley is rescued from the war-torn future and sent back to the past under the guise of grounding John to humanity by keeping him from Cameron. In reality, she is being used by Jesse in the hopes that Cameron terminates her so that John loses total confidence in her. Derek Reese. Possibly the most accurate and devastating death on TV. A Terminator does their job, and there's no fanfare, no swelling of music. Derek dies in the line of duty, and there's no time to mourn. The only tenuous link to John's father and his future, John is forced to pull up his bootstraps, so to speak, as he can no longer rely on Derek's protection. The Sarah Connor Chronicles has the best music outside of Brad Fidel's original two Lots scores. Of people come up to me after a show and they say, "What kind of drugs do you use up there, man? It's called adrenaline. You can use it too. You know where you get it? Right here. Try it. It's the only safe one." Fidel fought machines for the first score. Master the Fairlight for the sequel. The Bear's approach adds a human element that was missing from the first two films' scores. The Bear expands on the percussive elements for the machines and the touching humanistic themes for the central characters. 
Here's but a few. Sarah's theme moves from a minor key to a major uplift. It's meant to split between Sarah's duality of mom and ultimate hero. John's theme. The melody can be played in a major or minor tonality as John shifts between vulnerability, confusion, and eventually strength and certainty. Derek's theme, or themes. Derek's initial theme is aggressive and often switches meter. Bear states that it underscores his determination and loyalty. His later theme is more melancholic and placed in moments when his motives are uncertain. The infiltrator theme, the rhythmic dying robotic breath, occasionally used when Cameron's motives are questioned. Ellison's theme. The FBI agent that goes from skeptic to believer moves from a simple arrangement to a complex and more full variation. Dollhouse, say it again. <laughs> Your, your brains are... Okay, Dollhouse, Dollhouse, freaking house. Fox canceled the show because money. And because Dollhouse was one place higher on the ratings. And what was Dollhouse, you ask? Because you definitely don't remember? Well, I'll tell you. It was legendary auteur slash future garbage human being Joss Whedon's show about women being turned into sex dolls or something. Hey, why would you say something so controversial yet so brave? You're f***ing insane because I would never write that. So where was it all headed? Nothing official is known, but there is a legendary forum post that was either written by showrunner Josh Friedman or by one of his writer-producer cronies that laid out a four-season structure for the show. Could I find this post? No, just its tribute. A World Without John In the series finale, John and Catherine Weaver use a time-displacement machine to return to the future she's presumably from. Here we see Derek alive and well, and a very human Allison and Kyle Reese. None of them have ever heard of John. John Henry vs. Skynet Before everyone takes off, John Henry asks if Cameron will join him, or us. He then crosses through the veil ahead of John with Cameron's CPU. Clearly fighting Skynet in the past was no longer viable, and both he and Cameron knew this. Daniel Dyson Hidden throughout the series are mentions of the Dyson family. Danny would have been central, as it is theorized, work would have continued through his efforts, like father, like son. The Allison Camera Savannah Triangle. John would have had the distinction of having to choose between man and machine. John of the past knows Cameron, or his future John, that no longer exists, presumably befriended Allison. Savannah knew John Henry as a friend and confidant in her youth. That theme would have carried over when she finally catches up with them in the new timeline. Sarah Connor and James Ellison. Sarah and James chose to stay behind and prevent Skynade on their end. Sarah stays, out of duty or obligation. James, because he's stunned. He also gets tasked with taking care of Savannah. Sarah's cancer would have returned to the future, but not before her and Ellison would have raised Savannah in the ways of future prep. I should probably explain the cancer thing. Throughout the series, Sarah is told that she's going to pass away due to cancer. Their initial time jump jumps over her death, but there are several instances throughout the show where she is confronted with things that may give her cancer. Elements such as a nuclear power station that later serves as a resistance base, and the very core that powers Cameron's body. Peace between man and machine. Despite efforts of the cyborg resistance offering a collaboration with John, it is mentioned that peace would have been either possible or the end goal. This tracks, as I said earlier, there's no way humans would be able to pull this feat off themselves. Crap, this video is way too long. Just, just watch the show, okay? Just watch it. It's good. It's really good, I promise. Okay, Tom. Jeez, I'm sorry. And touch the face of God. Nothing else works. Call a cab.